The Fire Emblem Iceberg. After the success of my Metal Gear Solid Iceberg, link in the description, go check it out, I decided I wanted to keep the party going, and there's only two things I know more about than Metal Gear. Debilitating Loneliness, and Fire Emblem. Well, also Twin Peaks. So, three things, really. If you're not familiar with an iceberg, it's just an excuse to talk about secrets and easter eggs and trivia about a given topic. The top layer is common anecdotes, but the further you go down, you'll get into all sorts of juicy secrets and conspiracy theories. For this video, I'll be covering the Fire Emblem games released in North America. I'm also not going to cover the spin-off games, because I think they're dumb. Leave a comment below telling me why I'm actually the dumb one who sucks and doesn't know anything at all. And while you're there, like and subscribe. Alright, let's get into the iceberg. Roy may be known as the Young Lion and the heir of Fere, but to most people, he's the Marth clone from Smash that has a stronger B attack with flames and is cooler. I, like most 12 year olds at the time, enamored with Smash Bros. Melee, had never heard of the Fire Emblem franchise, and so when the Blazing Blade made its appearance on the GBA not long after, I had to try it. And, well, the rest is history. Roy never showed up in the Blazing Blade though. Instead, it stars his dad, Elliewood, and it's a sequel to Roy's game, The Binding Blade. Sadly, it never came to the US, although there is an English dub available, and damn it, I will play it one of these days, it's been on the backlog, alright? Anyways, it turns out that Roy's first appearance in a game was, in fact, in Melee. He was added to the roster to build hype for the upcoming Binding Blade, and yeah, I'd say that marketing strategy worked. Fun fact, Roy technically made his first public appearance in the promotional material for the Binding Blade, which was shown off at Nintendo's 2001 Space World event. So, what you're seeing right now is the very first time the world ever saw Roy. That's pretty cool. The first game in the series, Shadow Dragon and the Blade of Light, definitely shows its age the most. I love the young people! The story follows the exiled Prince Marth on his journey to retake the throne and stop the evil sorcerer Garnef and his master, the Shadow Dragon. While it introduces a lot of the core elements of the series, it's just a really dated game. Super slow, unintuitive menus, kind of a basic story, the whole thing. And I'm not the only one who thinks so, because Fire Emblem developer Intelligence Systems rebooted this game so many times it'd give Spider-Man a run for its money. I mean seriously, Madam Web now? Come on. Four years later, the third game in the series, Mystery of the Emblem, would do something kind of interesting. The first half of the game is a remake of Shadow Dragon, this time being enhanced by the power of the Super Famicom, and the second half of the game is a continuation of Marth's story. Intelligence Systems remaking the game that they had just made four years earlier is really odd, but if you think Marth's adventures are over, <laughs> oh buddy. 18 years later, Shadow Dragon was remade again for the Nintendo DS, this time with supposedly better graphics. They also added new characters, brought in the Weapon Triangle, and a couple other improvements. Two years later, they remade Mystery of the Emblem using the same art style and assets, creatively naming it New Mystery of the Emblem, and marking the third time Marth's story was remade. How many times do we have to teach you this lesson, old man? To celebrate the 30th anniversary of the series, Intelligence Systems released the original Shadow Dragon on the Switch, officially in English for the first time ever. It even came with this decorative NES cartridge, which I neglected to pre-order, and now all my waking hours are full of heartbreak and regret. So if you've ever wanted to play the first Fire Emblem, you've got some options. Speaking of remakes, let's talk about the second Fire Emblem, Gaiden. Released in 1992, the second entry in the Fire Emblem series was considered a commercial success, despite mixed reviews from the critics. It focuses on two protagonists, Alm and Celica, childhood friends who reunite years later to drive an invading nation out of their home. Gaiden mixed things up a lot with new gameplay elements, like an overworld map, a fatigue system, and alternating between controlling two different parties. There was a lot of little changes too, like weapons having unlimited durability and magic consuming the caster's HP. Gaiden took a lot of swings, and not everyone liked that. Fifteen years later, Gaiden was remade for the Nintendo 3DS with the new title, Fire Emblem Echoes Shadows of Valencia. Echoes would be the first time an English-speaking audience would get to play, and it even featured full voice acting and cutscenes 
really fleshing out and expanding the original game's story. For me, this game is a really weird one. It uses the same engine and assets from Awakening and Fates, but it retains the same battle mechanics from the original Famicom game. So all the extra stuff the 3DS games added, like pairing up and the marriage system, aren't here. The presentation of the game is fantastic, but is completely at odds with how simplistic the gameplay is. I get wanting to make it true to the original, but it's just so basic and the tactician in me was screaming out for more depth. The 3DS version did some good things though. It added additional content like side quests and an extra act in the main storyline and support conversations. So Echoes is pretty much an improvement of Gaiden in every way. Fire Emblem Engage was a visual treat, and the combat was really solid and fleshed out. The characters in the storyline, eh, not so much. Hiya, papaya. I mean, look at these clowns. Remember when Fire Emblem characters were like noble knights that took themselves seriously? The Engage cast is like watching Gen Z kids performing Shakespeare on TikTok. But fortunately, the real draw to this game is the nostalgia factor, and it definitely delivers on that front. Each paralogue is based on an important location and story beat from a previous game. The Exalt paralogue, for example, takes you to an arena that's meant to resemble Arena Faro from Awakening. This is where Lucina fought her father Krom while still disguised as Marth. The cool thing about these paralogues is that even the enemy placement is similar to the games they were based on, making each paralogue feel more like an HD remake of that particular level. The Instructor Paralogue is designed after the Holy Tomb Battle from Three Houses, which is the most crucial point in the story where all the different paths branch from. Likewise, in the Crux of Fate Paralogue, you're placed in a recreation of Chapter 6 of Fates, where you have to decide if you'll join Hoshido or Nor. Say what you will about Engage, and I've personally said a lot about it already in my Engage retrospective, link in the description, but you can't deny the level of detail and care put into making these paralogues feel like a good old blast from the past. By 2012, Fire Emblem seemed to be on its last legs. There hadn't been a new original game since 2007 with Radiant Dawn, and that game didn't really make a big splash, which may have been because of Ike's less than stellar popularity in Japan. You guys all think you're so much better than me! And there's also the fact that it was a Wii exclusive. The Wii catered to a middle of the road audience, and it really wasn't the place for a complex strategy game. After Radiant Dawn, Intelligent Systems released the remakes of Shadow Dragon and Mystery of the Emblem and neither really did amazingly well. So the Big N told Intelligence Systems that if they don't sell 250,000 units of their upcoming game, then the series would be permanently shut down. I declare bankruptcy! So Intelligence Systems knew that they had better put everything they have into this upcoming game because it very well might be the last one. Development started in 2010 and was headed up by Genki Yokata who had just finished directing Xenoblade Chronicles. Yokata knew that drawing in new players was the only thing that might save the series. Breaking from tradition, a casual mode was added which removed permadeath, a staple of the series. Another new feature added was the ability to pair units together in battle. They benefit from the attributes of the other at the expense of making actions independently. The point being to emphasize the ties and bonds between the characters. Love and camaraderie were major themes of the story, so it made a lot of sense to incorporate that into the gameplay. The marriage system wasn't a first in the series, but it was the best version of it, and it helped evolve the series' signature support system. The Avatar unit could marry anyone, and almost every other unit can marry whomever. The scope of the potential relationships between all the characters is tremendous. In April of 2012, the hard work of intelligence systems would finally pay off. Fire Emblem Awakening sold amazingly well in Japan, with pre-orders for the game even crashing the official website. It would take a year before the rest of the world would see the game, but when it did, it was celebrated as one of the best games in the series. Within two years, the game sold almost 2 million copies worldwide, far surpassing Nintendo's 250,000 unit ultimatum, and also making it the best-selling Fire Emblem game in the series up till that point. The Triangle Attack is a special move that could be performed by three units of the same class if they surround an enemy in a triangle formation. 
I used to think this move could only be done with Pegasus Riders, but apparently it could be done with others as well. While it looks cool, it's not really very practical. Like getting another bonsai tree, even though you literally never kept one alive for a week before. The problem with the triangle attack is that you need to clump your units together and use up their turns and then hope that the critical hit is enough to one hit kill the enemy, which may not happen. So yeah, it's not really that useful, it's just cool to see your units do a coordinated Power Rangers teamwork attack. Anna is a reoccurring character that appears in some form in every Fire Emblem game, except for Gaiden for some reason. Like Kang the Conqueror, she exists in multiple realities and works towards bending all universes towards her will. Actually, she's usually just there to sell you items or load your save. She's sort of the mascot character for the franchise, and will probably remain the mascot as Sami didn't really take off. I mean, look at this cursed little Pomeranian looking mother Usually taking the role of a traveling merchant, there isn't really much to her history. Apparently in the first game she was engaged to Jake from State Farm, but otherwise she has no ties to any of the characters. Awakening was the first game that let you recruit her as a playable unit, and it also established that Anna has multiple sisters and cousins all sharing the same name, and that's the in-universe explanation for all the Annas. Fates took it a little further by explaining that each Anna has a different pronunciation to tell them apart. Which is funny because, I mean, how many ways can you really pronounce Anna? Six. The answer is six. Personally, I've never been a big fan of recruiting her. The whole appeal of Fire Emblem characters is their relationship to the story and to each other, and for the most part, Anna has no bearing on any story she's in, and she rarely has support conversations with others at all. Engage did fix this by making her a legitimate character, so that's a step in the right direction. The shared continents and worlds in the Fire Emblem universe could be a little confusing, so let's go over it in unnecessarily long and drawn out detail. Arcania is the continent that Shadow Dragon and Mystery of the Emblem take place in. Gaiden takes place on Valencia, which is just west of Arcania, so they're all in the same world. Awakening is actually an indirect sequel to Mystery of the Emblem, taking place 2000 years later, after Arcania was renamed Elise, and Valencia was renamed Valm after Gaiden's protagonist, Alm. Genealogy of the Holy War and its sequel, Thrasha 776, takes place in Jugdral, a continent that exists in the same world as Arcania, but is far away enough that there doesn't seem to be that much of a connection between the two, and it also takes place like a thousand plus years in the past. Alib is the main continent where the Binding Blade and the Blazing Blade take place. This one is up for debate whether it's part of the same world or not. There's no direct evidence, just circumstantial stuff like the fact that Carol and Carla came from ancestors that sailed to Sakai from a different continent, or the fact that Nils might be a character from Genealogy of the Holy War, but we'll get into that later. The Sacred Stones takes place in Magville, which seems to be its own isolated thing. It may exist in the Arcania world, or it may not. There's really not a ton of evidence one way or the other. FE 9 and 10 are both set in Tellius, which is a completely different world than Arcania, which makes sense since these games were made by different developers. But even if they were in the same world, it'd be much earlier or much later than the other games, as a great flood destroys everything but Tellius before Path of Radiance begins. Fire Emblem Fates is a weird one. It's the only game where the main continent isn't named. Like, really guys, you didn't think that would be important? There's a DLC level for Fates, called Before Awakening, where Corrin goes through the Outrealm gate and ends up in Elise. Corrin meets Krom, and Krom mentions that they're all familiar with Hoshido and Nor, but as legends. Now, it's not clear if the Outrealm Gate is a time travel or interdimensional thing, or both, but if enough people in Elise have heard of Fate's Land, enough for it to become this ubiquitous legend, like Atlantis or El Dorado, then it means that Fate's Land is definitely from their world's past, rather than an alternate dimension thing. And since we know Elise is Arcania, it's fair to say Fate's Land is also part of that world. Three Houses is set in Fodland, and it has no connection to any of the other games, it's just doing its own thing. Lastly, there's Engage, which takes place in Ilios. The storyline makes it reasonably clear that the Emblem heroes all come from different worlds and timelines, thus making Ilios exist in a different world. So to summarize, every game exists in the same world, except for Engage, Three Houses, Path of Radiance, Radiant Dawn, and maybe Sacred Stones. Does that make things more clear? Good. Well, I think we all learned some important lessons here today, and had some laughs along the way. 
I've been Wes, and... Wait, we still have four more layers of the iceberg to go? <laughs> Alright, well, I guess you should all get comfortable then. And also, hey, you know, how about hitting subscribe and checking out some of my other amazing, amazing videos, won't you? I've mentioned a few Fire Emblem games in the previous layer of the iceberg that my fellow Hakujin may not have recognized. And the reason for that is, unsurprisingly, uh, not every Fire Emblem game got localized outside of Japan. Shadow Dragon only just got localized in English, and Gaiden got an English remake as Shadows of Valencia. So what does that leave? Mystery of the Emblem, Genealogy of the Holy War, Thracia 776, and The Binding Blade. All four of these have pretty decent English fan translations, and certain eBay merchants even sell bootleg carts so you could play them on the original hardware in English, which I genuinely find really cool. Mystery of the Emblem, like I mentioned earlier, is one half Shadow Dragon remake and one half continuation. The second half of the story centers on Hardin, one of Marth's allies, becoming the Emperor of Arcania. He becomes corrupted by Garneth's magic, which, by the way, Garneth is still alive, and brands Marth and his party as traitors, forcing our protagonist to flee and find a way to break the spell cast on Hardin. Marth also needs to defeat Garneth again, and the Shadow Dragon, Medeus, again. This is basically the Die Hard 2 of the franchise. Genealogy of the Holy War, on the other hand, was a totally original creation. The story isn't anything new, an ancient evil dragon is revived by a cult, and a blue-haired protagonist needs to stop them by using a divine weapon, same as before. But halfway through the game, there's a time skip, and the second half you'll be playing as the descendants of the original characters. Genealogy introduced the marriage system, where two units pair up, and their stats are divided and inherited by their child unit in the second half of the game. Some units are better suited for each other than others, some units just want to be loved, and some are just there for the zipline. I feel like you're just here for the zipline. Genealogy also introduced the weapon triangle and support conversations, which became staples in the series. Basically, this is the game in the series where things start to get really good. Thracia 776 takes place between Chapter 5 and 8 of the second half of the last Fire Emblem game. So technically, it's not a sequel, but a mid-quill. The story follows Leaf, Sigurd's nephew, and the exiled heir of Munster, fighting to reclaim his home from the invading Granville Empire. Thrasha introduced a few new things that remained in the series, and a few that didn't. Fog of War, where you can only see a few tiles around you, became a staple in the series. It also introduced Gaiden Chapters, which are bonus levels that get unlocked if you complete certain objectives. Escape was added as a chapter objective, meaning the player has to get all the units to an escape point to win the match. And finally, the rescue command was added, allowing mounted units to pick up unmounted units. A fatigue meter was added as well that made it so that you couldn't use the same characters throughout the entire game. This feature sucks, and I'm glad that it didn't become a staple. There's also a capture feature that allows you to rob enemies if their HP is under a certain amount. I really like this idea, and I don't know why it got scrapped. Finally, there's The Binding Blade, which is a prequel to The Blazing Blade, and stars Eliwood's son, Roy, and Hector's daughter, Lelina. The nation of Burn has invaded their home of Lycia, and it's up to the two of them to rally an army strong enough to repel them. The Binding Blade was the first Fire Emblem on a handheld console, and it's pretty much responsible for bringing Fire Emblem to the West via Roy and Smash. And now you're all caught up on the Japanese-only Fire Emblem games. For Japanese eyes only! If you've ever played Fire Emblem Awakening, there's one detail that you've probably noticed, especially if you're Dan Schneider. 
None of the characters' 3D models have any feet. An interview with the game's art director, Toshiyuki Kusakahara, revealed that it was a corner-cutting measure, as it would be easier to animate the models without having to worry about their feet. They also weren't sure if the 3DS, which was a new system for them to work on, would be able to handle the extra animation data. They ended up finding out that the handheld was more than capable of rendering Chrom's little tozy wozies This was fixed in Fire Emblem Fates, making Awakening forever known as that weird one where people have little pointy nubbies. Canis is an interesting character in the Blazing Blade. Not only is he the only recruitable shaman, he's also the only one in your party whose name sounds like Anus. So, that's fun. He also has a lot of familiar connections to characters from the Binding Blade. He's Hughes' father and Nimi's son. He's also married to an unknown woman, but it's believed that her sister is Iris, Nino's mom, which would make Canis Nino's uncle-in-law. This is all to say, with all these loved ones, it's extra sad to learn that he dies right after the game's conclusion. His end text says that he returned home and he and his wife died trying to stop a snowstorm. Personally, I hate these kind of endings. It's like the end of American Graffiti, a pretty lighthearted movie, then there's just this text on the screen saying half of them died. I mean, what kind of unnecessary bummer is that? Fun fact, Canis has an alternate death quote asking his mother to take care of Hugh. There's a lot of debate as to what triggers this quote to unlock, with some people saying that you have to beat the game eight times, which may sound like one of those ridiculous schoolyard rumors, but Fire Emblem actually does have a history of hiding easter eggs behind insanely high requirements, but we'll get into that later. Fire Emblem Awakening had an interesting roster of characters. Some say that they were too gimmicky, but I don't think that they were jumping the shark just yet. Yes, I'm looking at you, Engage. Among the cast was Tharja, a broody goth girl who develops a stalker obsession with the player avatar Robin. A little while after Awakening was released, a beach-themed DLC level dropped, and naturally, it featured several characters in their beach attire. Tharja is featured wearing a skimpy outfit, which shouldn't be that crazy because her default outfit is already pretty skimpy, but for some reason this version was unacceptable to show to an American audience. So we Americans got a weird little cape covering her ass, while people in Japan got to see her whole peach. But because this is a deep dive for only the most devoted Fire Emblem fans, I think it's definitely necessary to show this image. For science. So here it is. Duh. Introducing Tharja's Ass. Speaking of controversial censorship stuff, there was a support conversation in Fire Emblem Fates that was rewritten shortly before the game's Western release. So Lil is the daughter of Laszlo slash Inigo, and a pretty cheerful and upbeat character. She's attracted to other girls, so much so that it becomes a distraction for her on the battlefield. In her support conversations with Corin, she admits that she's so flustered around pretty girls that it's distracting her from becoming a better warrior. Corin tries to help her by secretly adding a magic potion to her drink that makes it so that she sees girls as guys and vice versa. This leads to her seeing Corin as female and falling in love with him. When the powder wears off, she's still in love with him because she fell in love with his inner self or whatever. Some people took umbrage with this plot because of how it came off as both date rapey and sort of also seemed to be about gay conversion therapy. To me, the real crime here is the bad writing. I mean, this whole thing reads like horny fanfiction you'd see on someone's Tumblr in 2009. Whether or not the implications of the scene were intentional, Nintendo decided to err on the side of caution. So for the English release, they changed the magic powder to a blindfold for Salil to wear so that she couldn't see all them babes wandering around, and changed the dialogue to really emphasize that she was consenting to Corin's plan. 
So, uh, listen, I think you're really pretty and interesting, and I'd kind of like to take you upstairs and totally crush your Would that be acceptable to you? Oh, well, I, I, I guess it would. No, I'm sorry, I need affirmative consent. I'll need you to say, yes, you may take me upstairs and crush my at this time. Oh my god, Fates. You're still up to no good, huh? We're all familiar with the support system in Fire Emblem, where you could gradually unlock conversations between two units as their bond grows throughout the game. Except for Dorcas and Veda, who somehow end up knowing even less about each other by the end. But for the player's avatar, well, they get a little something extra for whoever they bond with. If Corrin invites a unit to join them in their private quarters, it will unlock a scene showing a full model of the character for you to ogle at. Or maybe they're ogling at you, I don't know. In the Japanese version, this is a mini-game where you have to fill up a gauge by tapping the screen with your stylus. If you could fill up the gauge, then your bond will increase. So, yes, this is essentially a seduction game where you're filling up your unit's horniness meter. When asked about why the petting was removed from the Western release, Nintendo said, even in the Japanese original version, we have not included any features which are considered inappropriate in Japan. Having said that, however, making changes are not unusual when we localize games, and we have indeed made changes in these games. I didn't do f***ing sh I didn't f***ing do this! So Nintendo kind of gave a non-answer here, but American censorship tends to lean into the prudish territory, and I'm assuming the actual interaction of making your character hot and heavy was what crossed the line. But without the tapping, there's really no point of the minigame being included at all. The weird thing is, when I played this game years ago, I distinctly remember tapping the screen for these parts. Maybe it's just a Mandela effect, like Sinbad and Kazam, but I sure feel like I tapped on those faces. Hey everybody, it's Wes from Wes Does Games. I'm the person who's making the video you're watching. Uh, do you like wearing t-shirts? Specifically long sleeve shirts or short sleeve shirts because that's also an option. Do you like Fire Emblem? Do you like, uh, which character do you like? Do you like Roy? Fuck you, I got Lucina. So hopefully that's your favorite character. I might do other characters if this shirt sells well, but we'll see. <laughs> Anyways, this comes in multiple colors. Um, you know, it's a pretty great shirt, and for the for the Japanese inclined people who can speak that language, uh, West does games and Fire Emblem in Japanese. Isn't that cool? What a cool shirt you're saying. How could I get a piece of this action? Go to fourthwall.com slash, I don't remember what the address is, so I'm just going to put it on the screen. I'm going to put in the link on the screen and you could follow it yourself and buy this shirt. Help support small businesses made up of one person named Wes. Go to fourthwall.com slash whatever the link is and buy this shirt. It's Lucina from Fire Emblem. Thank you. Here's the rest of the video now. Thanks. Did you think I was done talking about American censorship in Fire Emblem games? Well, surprise mother We've already talked about Anna, the plucky, multiversal merchant who pops up throughout the series, but usually just as a cameo and not anything more significant. But in Fire Emblem Engage, she's finally a marriage option. Finally, I can marry a redhead in a Fire Emblem game that's not bland-ass Sakura. Finally, I could- She's only 12 years old! What?! Oh. This 12? 12, Charlie! Oh, that actually explains a lot. Yep. Engage went an interesting route and decided to make Anna an 11 year old girl this time. So what does that mean for her S support with Alir? While the Western localization team made sure to emphasize the platonic nature of the player's relationship with Anna, the original Japanese script was like, it, you can marry her if you want. Marry that girl, marry her anyway. The S support dialogue in question was translated by this Twitter user. And this is after Alir gives Anna the pact ring. Anna. I'm still a child, so I may not be ready for these sort of things. Then Alir says, Even if it's too soon for us to be lovers, we could still be partners, don't you think? What in the Donald Trump child beauty pageant shit is this? 
Needless to say, the English version emphasizes that they're just friends. Nothing more. Nothing more. Did you really think I was done talking about Fire Emblem letting you date a minor? Well, surprise, mother. Lynn, or Lindis if you're nasty, was one of the first female lords in a Fire Emblem game, first introduced in the Blazing Blade. Her section of the story serves as a big tutorial to familiarize the US audience with how these games work. Lynn is supposed to be 15 in the original Japanese version, but when it was imported to the US, they bumped her age up to 18. This is merely subjecture, but I think this is probably because at the end of the game, if Eliwood or Hector S ranks Lynn, they'll marry her, and I believe it's stated that her giving birth to Roy or Lelina happened shortly after, meaning she would have given birth at like 16 or 17. Which would be... ish. Why don't you have a seat there and uh, get comfortable for that? So, I don't blame them for changing it. Fire Emblem Fates may not be my favorite game in the series. It may have a lousy story and badly written characters. And sure, it may have ripped off the child system from Awakening even though there's no story justification for it this time around. And sure, the antagonists are lame in one note. Nevertheless, having two versions of the game, like Pokemon, was a unique choice and made Fates far more memorable. But that's not entirely true. There's actually a third edition that came out originally as DLC called Revelation. It's not a single level or anything, it's a full-on campaign, and just as long as Birthright and Conquest. In Revelation, Corrin chooses neither Hoshido nor... Uh... Nor. Wait, you could completely sidestep all the heartbreak and deaths from Fates by just saying, Nah, dog? Why didn't I think of that? Aside from a very rare special edition of Fates, which included all three paths on one cartridge, Revelation was download only. And in 2023, Nintendo decided to pull the plug on both the Wii U and 3DS eShop, meaning all the digital content, including games and DLC, would be forever lost to time unless already saved on your 3DS. Fortunately, I had already bought and downloaded Revelation when it came out, and now I definitely need to protect my 3DS from harm. My 3DS is my little baby Yoda now, and I will keep it safe forever. The crazy thing about all this is that Revelation isn't just an alternate narrative, it's the canon ending to the game. Birthright and Conquest both end with incomplete stories, and Revelation gives you the final piece of the puzzle, and the only true happy ending. So for this game, especially, to become lost media is a travesty. I mean, yeah, it's not my favorite Fire Emblem, but damn it, it deserves to be preserved. I felt I should mention that most of my sources for this topic, as well as several others in this iceberg, came from the good people at Serene's Forest. You guys are doing Naga's work. Thank you. Hey, did you know that there was going to be a second Fire Emblem on the Wii? After Radiant Dawn, Intelligent Systems began working on an elusive Wii title, which they codenamed Elusive Wii Title. It appears that for this game, they were going to dip their feet into the real-time strategy pool, kind of like Final Fantasy XII. Not sure how that would work with such a giant roster of units, but the article suggests it may work like Pikmin, where you sort of direct swarms of units where to go and then the AI does the rest. There's a few concept screenshots of characters in civilian settings, which at the time wasn't something we really ever saw in the series until Fire Emblem Engage in the post-battles. This may indicate the player being able to wander around on foot in villages like in a regular RPG. The title didn't make it too far before being scrapped, likely due to Radiant Dawn's poor sales. This game would have mixed things up too much, and Intelligent Systems ultimately decided to go the safer route and remake Shadow Dragon, expecting that to be a hit. Still, the idea of a Fire Emblem RTS is intriguing, and maybe someday we'll get it. Maybe. Speaking of cancelled games, the 3DS apparently was going to have a fourth Fire Emblem game, but unfortunately, it never got very far. A former senior editor at Game Informer revealed that the project was in the works after Shadows of Valencia, but was ultimately scrapped. The reason being the decline of 3DS game sales, and how late in the life cycle that handheld was. He speculated that they may be saving this game for the Switch. This interview was before Three Houses came out, so it's either a dead idea or just on the backlog. Since Shadow Dragon, Gaiden, and Mystery of the Emblem already got remakes, Genealogy of the Holy War would be next in line. Personally, a remake of that game on the Switch would be pretty awesome, 
Although this late in the Switch's lifespan means if we were to see it, it'd probably be on the Switch 2, or the Super Switch, calling it now. Genealogy of the Holy War turns 30 in 2026, so that seems like an ideal time to release a remake. Some staff at Intelligence Systems have also shown an interest in a Binding Blade remake, which I also think would be very cool. The Game Boy Advance Link Cable. There was one that went from your GameCube to your Game Boy Advance, and one that went between 2 to 4 GBAs, and they were freaking sick. Before mobile games and all the modern internet-based stuff we take for granted, handheld video games were pretty much a solo experience. Then came the GBA Link Cable, which finally let me play multiplayer games with my friends at school. On my lunch breaks, my friends and I would take out our GBAs, unravel these very long and bunched up cords, and play the, like, couple of games that were compatible. Honestly, there weren't a lot. I believe you could trade Pokemon and maybe a few other things, but uh, we used it for two games in particular, Battling Each Other in Golden Sun and Fire Emblem. The Link Arena was a mode available in all three GBA Fire Emblem games, where you could face up to three of your friends using five of your units from your save file and have one-on-one -on -one duels with them. It was a blast. In Path of Radiance, you could use the GameCube GBA Link Cable, along with a copy of Binding Blade, Blazing Blade, or Sacred Stones, to unlock extra trial maps. Trial maps are basically just endgame challenge maps that are added as a fun bonus for beating the game. They were included in Path of Radiance, the Binding Blade, they were sort of included in Sacred Stones, which I'll cover in the next Iceberg topic, and for some reason, they weren't in Blazing Blade at all. So with the three GBA games, there's three maps to unlock in Path of Radiance, which is a pretty cool bonus. I'll have more to say about trial maps later in the iceberg, by the way. The Sacred Stones didn't have trial maps per se, but it did have a bonus after game mode called Creature Campaign that allowed you to continue wandering the world map, fighting randomly spawned monster enemies. You can also revisit the Tower of Valny, a location full of monsters that you could use to train indefinitely and level up between chapters. The tower has eight floors, and beating certain floors will unlock secret characters, mostly enemy bosses you fought in the main storyline. The Lagdo Ruins is basically a harder version of the tower. It has ten parts, with stronger enemies and ten freaking zombie dragons as the final boss. Like the Tower of Volney, beating certain areas will unlock more characters, but for the ultimate ultimate challenge, Beat all ten stages of the ruins three times, and you'll get the final unlockable of the game. Lion, the final boss and main antagonist of the game, will join you. Ever heard of Fire Emblem Maiden of Darkness? Hard to believe, but this isn't a death metal band, but an unreleased N64 game. Not a lot is known about this one, but the 25th anniversary art book does shed a little bit of light on what could have been. The game was still being developed at the end of the N64's life cycle, so pretty much all the game's assets had to be scrapped so they could start over on the upcoming GameCube. There's also other causes that for one reason or another meant that all the story and characters had to be scrapped too. It was going to star Roy, but he ended up getting saved for the Binding Blade instead. Well, him and Carol! This is the only screenshot of the game, and it stars Ephraim and Ray. 
There's also an Elliewood character, so of course a lot of these names would be recycled in later games. The 25th anniversary book also shows off some concept art that's never been published before. Looks like Roy was originally named Ike. Pretty cool. Plenty of people have probably never heard about Tear Ring Saga before. It's never been re-released or remade, and it never officially made its way out of Japan. But the game was well received at the time, and has since developed a small cult following, so let's talk about it. Fire Emblem Daddy Shozu Kaga started developing ideas for this game around or before 1999, while working on his last Fire Emblem game, Thrasha 776. Shortly after, he left Intelligence Systems to go create his own company, Turnagog, which he named after a small town from Genealogy of the Holy War. Kaga's first game from this new company was going to be called Emblem Saga, and naturally, it had a lot of similarities to Fire Emblem because, duh, he made Fire Emblem. Nintendo wasn't having it though, not wanting Kaga to pull a Michael Scott Paper Company kind of situation where he would siphon business away from his former employer. So multiple lawsuit threats later, Kaga decided to try to un-Fire Emblem his game as much as possible. He stopped promoting it as a spiritual successor to Fire Emblem, and changed the name to Tear Ring Saga. Nintendo struck a small victory against Innerbrain, the publisher of the game, but ultimately lost the battle in court, and Tear Ring Saga was allowed to be sold. Years later, Kaga would make a sequel for the PS2, called Tear Ring Saga Berwick Saga, which is just a terrible name, by the way. There were a lot of story similarities between Berwick and Path of Radiance, which came out around the same time. There's speculation that Tellius, the company that worked on Path of Radiance and Radiant Dawn, used production notes and ideas Kaga had left at Intelligence Systems and used that to form the storyline. It's pretty clear Kaga drew inspiration from those old ideas, too. Kind of a prestige and the illusionist kind of situation. Or ants in a bug life. Or Friday the 13th and 13 going on 30. Unfortunately, Berwick didn't sell very well, so that was pretty much it for the Shozu Kaga paper company. He did kind of keep the series going though years later by self-publishing the Vesteria Saga, a game that, well, looks like it was made in RPG Maker 2000. Kind of a fall from grace from his former Fire Emblem days, but hey, you either die the hero or live long enough to start self-publishing Steam exclusives. <laughs> Super Smash Bros. was a dream come true for 10-year-olds in the 90s that wanted nothing more than to see their favorite Nintendo characters beating the shit out of each other for no discernible reason. Nowadays, there's no shortage of characters, especially Fire Emblem characters, in Smash. I mean, do we really need Corrin? Does anyone actually like Corrin? Please let me know in the comments if you're scoring with Corrin. But in the original Smash, the roster was pretty limited, with the dainty little N64's hardware already stretched pretty thin. So naturally, some characters originally planned for the game had to get benched. Some characters that we know were cut were Bowser, King Dedede, and Mewtwo. And then there's Marth. In the 25th anniversary art book that I mentioned earlier, there's an interview with Smash Daddy Mashahiro Sakurai, where he reveals that he originally wanted Marth to appear in the N64 game, but had to leave him out due to time restraints. Sakurai said that he really wanted another sword user besides Link in the game, and specifically a sword user that fought with more finesse and technique. He made it a priority to include him in Melee, with Roy being his clone character. Some Smash fans probably remember the Smash Bros. Dojo, where Sakurai would regularly update and tease Brawl before its release, but that was actually a successor to a Japanese-only version of the site that was made to hype up people for Melee. It featured a poll where fans could vote for who they wanted to see in the upcoming Smash, and raking in at number 11 was Marth. So, we've gone over trial maps and the over-the-top challenges required to unlock secret characters in the Sacred Stones. But the Binding Blade and Path of Radiance take it to a whole nother level. Wanna unlock Old Man Hector? Just beat the game. Three times in a row! What? Okay, what about Elliewood? Five times! What? King Zephiel and his sister Guinevere are unlockable too, which is really cool. Are they worth the trouble? Sure they are. That is, if you don't mind playing the entire game nine times in a row. This is pretty extreme, especially since you can literally only use these characters in trial maps, and there's only a handful of those. But hey, that's nothing compared to Path of Radiance. 
I had always heard as a kid that you could unlock the Mad King Ashnard if you beat the game a certain amount of times. This seemed like one of those rumors you hear as a kid to trick you into wasting a bunch of time, like being told that you could unlock Luigi in Super Mario 64 by joining Westa's Games' Patreon, which, that's actually true by the way, go ahead and do that now. You'll unlock Luigi, bro, trust me. So pair my natural skepticism with the fact that there is very little documentation of the following feat anywhere on the internet. No unlocking videos on YouTube, nobody doing it on a live stream, nothing. The only actual footage I could find of Ashnard is where he's already unlocked, and you know, how do I know that this isn't just a ROM hack and all the articles and anecdotal information about him being unlockable isn't just based on unverified rumors? How do I know that this isn't all just the Matrix? I mean, how could mirrors even be real if our eyes aren't real? Whoa. You may be wondering why I'm so skeptical of the authenticity of this specific unlockable compared to all the others that also seem crazy. Well, that's because in order to unlock Ashnard, you supposedly need to beat the game 15 times. And it's not like Path of Radiance is a short game either. This is actually one of the longer Fire Emblem games, clocking in at about 30 to 40 hours to beat. That means to get this one unit, you'd potentially need to play for about 525 hours or more than three weeks straight without stopping. Surely no game developer is that evil, right? Surely this is all a big prank like L is real, or Mew is under the truck, or female orgasms, right? <laughs> it's impossible to know without testing it out. But who would be stupid enough to waste so much of their time on something so trivial? Someone who values closure over all else, that's who. And thus, I began the grueling journey through Path of Radiance to discover the truth for myself. I'm not an idiot though, I fast forwarded through all the dialogue, skipped cutscenes, and added cheat codes to basically allow Ike to one hit kill everyone so we could move the shit along as fast as possible. After beating the game three times, I journeyed over to the trial maps and found Oliver there. You remember Oliver? He was the fat, hedonistic, slave owning villain from the main story. Well, now I get to play as him. What a treat! As I kept racking up playthroughs, other characters would gradually show up as well. Before I knew it, I was just jumping for joy at the prospect of unlocking my favorite villain, Ashnard. Finally, after 15 playthroughs, I can indeed confirm that Ashnard is unlockable. He's pretty fun to play as in the trial maps, he's just so OP, and he pretty much one hit kills the enemy units every time. Also his critical attack is pretty epic. So was it worth it? Absolutely not. F whoever was working at intelligence systems that decided to troll us so hard. But, was it worth it for my own peace of mind, finally discovering the truth for myself? Again, the answer is no. The Blazing Blade doesn't have the same emphasis on romance that Genealogy of the Holy War or Awakening does, but it does have nice little epilogues for each character and special ones for paired units. That's right, every character that can get an S rank with another will have their own paired endings, which is a nice incentive to not neglect your supports. Guy and Priscilla can S rank each other, but things don't end great for them. He was a mercenary, she was a princess, can I make it any more obvious? so he decides that his rank is too far beneath her and that it would never work. I mean, what would people say at the, pr the princess's ball? So he decides to go out for a gallon of milk and a carton of cigarettes, and she never sees him again. Not exactly a happy ending for this street rat, but in the Japanese version, Guy is like, I don't buy that, and decides to marry her anyways. It's not clear if this was an intentional choice by the English localization team, or just a weird translation mistake. The author of this article makes the suggestion that because you could write more with less characters in Japanese than in English, the localization may simply be the translators cutting down and rewriting the story to fit inside the text box. Honestly, it would be hilarious if Guy and Priscilla couldn't be together in the English version, simply because the translators couldn't find a way to paraphrase it. I've heard from plenty of people that Fire Emblem would make a good anime, what with its colorful haired protagonists, its fantastical setting, and its more recent weeb nature, what with the dragon wifeys and the big titties. But the thing about Fire Emblem being an anime is that it already is. <laughs> the anime in question was an OVA, for the non-nerds that means original video animation, 
and is basically a pilot. In 1996, two Japanese animation studios teamed up to create an OVA based on Mystery of the Emblem. The anime only lasted two episodes before being axed, presumably from lack of interest. It did get an English dub VHS release though, making it technically the first piece of Fire Emblem anything to reach a Western audience. Unfortunately. Kane is right! We must join up with Princess Nina and go to war! That's enough, Gordon! Let them go! Let them all go? But Mars! There's no need to go after those who fled. Mars? But fun fact, Marth's Japanese voice actor, Karu Midorikawa, has gone on to voice Marth in every iteration of the character. So, at least some good came out of it. Probably one of the most universally exploited hacks in the Blazing Blade is the Mind Glitch. A mine. When an enemy steps on a mine that you've placed, quickly reset the game. When you've loaded your save back up, you are no longer controlling your own players, but the enemy. There's all sorts of uses for this glitch, the most obvious being that you could just have all your enemies drop their weapons and make that level a cakewalk. You could also use the glitch to steal powerful weapons from enemies, such as Veda's magic-infused spear. Intelligent systems basically put everything they had into Awakening because, like I mentioned earlier, they thought it was their final Fire Emblem. So when it came to DLC and extra content, mm -mm, we were eating good. Delicious. Now to clarify, there is a difference between Spot Pass, which was exclusive to the 3DS, and regular old DLC. And the difference is... Uh... Wait, I know this. Spot Pass basically would send DLC-type stuff to your 3DS games that supported it. So rather than making you go out and download a bunch of little unlockables like songs or character outfits or whatever, your 3DS would just deliver it straight to your game which honestly was way more preferable. It's like, hey buddy, here's a nice little free treat for you. You earned it. Yahoo! But before we get into Awakening Spot Pass stuff, I did want to mention the DLC stuff real quick because it was pretty impressive. There were over two dozen extra levels, many of which featured characters from previous Fire Emblem games. This is basically Engage, but, you know, better. Hi up the character portraits for these past characters are all drawn by different artists, which I really wasn't a fan of. I like conformity, you know? Make all the portraits look the same, otherwise it feels like some DeviantArt fanfiction user-submitted mod, but that's just me. Now back to the Spot Pass. Awakening featured Spot Pass team challenges, which basically meant that an enemy would randomly appear on the world map, and if you engaged them, it would be like Ike, leading a team of characters from Path of Radiance. If you beat them, you'd unlock Ike. Now, this wasn't totally revolutionary or anything, they didn't make new character models for every single legacy character. More like a palette swap, or like if you were playing a character creator and you did your best to recreate Ike using stock assets. Still, it was better than nothing. And surprisingly, there was a whole 120 of these legacy characters for you to fight, so quite a lot went into this. Honestly, I wasn't even planning on talking about any of this, it's just that once I began diving into the Fire Emblem Awakening DLC world, there was so much more than I remembered. What I really wanted to talk about is the six bonus paralogue chapters you could unlock through Spot Pass. Now, it's debated in the Fire Emblem fandom whether or not the events in these paralogues are canon or not. The reason being that they are completely ridiculous and play out like fanfiction, either by disregarding themes set up by the main story or by just being completely implausible. You'll see what I mean. The first paralogue lets you recruit Gangrel, the Mad King of Plagia, who, uh, was supposed to be dead, but that's okay, because there's a story justification for it. What can't really be justified is Krom letting him join the party after Gangrel killed his sister. But the Mad King has a tragic backstory revealed here through some dialogue, and you know what? It's fine. I think we could excuse this one. Walhart, Yenfei, and Aversa 
also have their own chapters and are likewise recruitable. I think if just one of them were to have a surprise, I'm not really dead storyline, it would have been fine, but for all of them to be alive is pushing it a bit. But honestly, the real egregious one here is Emeryn. Killed halfway through the story, her death is an emotional catalyst that motivates several characters' actions throughout the remainder of the game. To bring her back kinda shits on that. Not to mention she fell from like a 200 foot tall cliff. There's no way she wouldn't just be pasta sauce on the pavement right now. The chapter does address the absurdity of this by countering with more absurdity. She hit her head and has amnesia. Okay guys. The paralogues aren't all fluff though. Several of the maps are recreations of locations from Shadow Dragon and Gaiden, which is a great touch for continuity. And the new recruits come with a few support conversations as well. Finally, we can marry Big Daddy Wallhart. Life goal accomplished. The last paralogue features a brand new character, Priam, who is supposedly a descendant of the Radiant Hero. I don't think they ever directly say the name Ike, but that means Ike. This is probably the most controversial paralog because it would officially connect the Tellius world to the Arcania world. A lot of Fire Emblem fans are adamant that these games take place in separate worlds, so the general consensus is that Priam is a liar. I mean, where's your Aether skill, bro? Then again, the fact that anyone in Awakening even knows about Ike means that he must have existed in some capacity in their world. I don't want to think about this anymore. Part of the fun of the Fire Emblem games is the self-imposed challenges that you can play with throughout the story. This is kind of a hard concept to explain, but I'll do my best. There's a lot of things you can do if you're curious enough to. For example, in Chapter 16 of The Blazing Blade, the goal is to reach the pirate captain Fargus without being killed. He's your only passage to reach Dread Isle, and he's offered a free ride if you could simply get past his pirates. If you speak to him, you've won. There is, however, the option to attack him, despite it being ill-advised because he's super powerful. And if you could actually kill him, it's game over. Fire Emblem often dangles these what-if carrots in front of the player, and if you're an OCD gamer like me, you just have to see what's down every rabbit hole. Fun fact, Fargus is the only boss in the entire Fire Emblem series where fighting him always results in a game over. So, don't do it, man. Just do it! No, don't do it. BS Fire Emblem, also known as Engage, but seriously, BS Fire Emblem was an episodic, arguably non-canon installment that takes place before Shadow Dragon. It was originally released in 1997 on the Satellaview, a device I didn't know existed until just now. It was a satellite modem that you'd connect to your Super Famicom, and it would let you download one megabyte's worth of data straight to your console. This was pretty revolutionary at the time, if you completely ignored the existence of the internet. Anyways, the goal of these game broadcasts were to gain as many points as possible by battling, opening chests, etc. A lot of the dialogue in the game was voice acted, but that audio was streamed live, meaning it doesn't exist in emulated form. BS Fire Emblem was remade as Arcania Chronicles and added as a bonus to the Japanese-only Mystery of the Emblem remake. The cutscenes and voice acting weren't included though, which makes BS Fire Emblem, in part at least, lost media. This one is pretty simple. In the Thousand Year Door, otherwise known as the last good Paper Mario game, Your booze mean nothing! I've seen what makes you cheer! There's a Toad who mentions being really into his Game Boy Advance. He says he's been playing Fire Emblem and that it's awesome. Well, guess who made the Paper Mario series? That's right, it's Intelligent Systems. Interestingly, in the original Japanese text, he instead says he's been playing Super Mario Bros. Considering the Thousand Year Door came out not long after the Blazing Blade, the dialogue was probably changed to give a little more attention to Fire Emblem's Western release. We all know about permadeath, where a party member dies in battle, has some depressing final line, and then is out of the game for good. Luthier, are you there? It, it hurts. Oh my god, that's sad. But what about the characters that are essential to the storyline? Well, every game is different, but usually there's a bit of dialogue at the end of the chapter that explains that they survived, but won't be fighting anymore. And of course, for the main characters, it's always a game over. Forgive me, everyone. My battle ends here. 
but in Shadows of Valencia, the game was originally designed to allow for the player to continue even if Celica died in battle. In the game's data is extra voiceover dialogue from different characters commenting on her death. Celica, your life had only just begun. This would have marked a first in the series, allowing a Lord character to die without a game over. Who knows what they were planning? I mean, they need to change cutscenes and add a ton of dialogue to make that work, but I think it would have made a cool twist. Thanks for the good folks at the cutting room floor for this juicy little trivia nugget. The Black Knight, not to be confused with the classic Martin Lawrence film, is a menacing presence from Path of Radiance who pretty quickly becomes the main antagonist after killing Ike's dad. He appears later in the game to challenge Ike, and seemingly dies without the player ever learning who he really was. Years later, Radiant Dawn would reveal that he was Zelgius, a minor character from the original game. This was a pretty cool twist, and while some people guessed it genuinely, most of us were pretty surprised. We shouldn't have been that surprised though, because Path of Radiance pretty much spoils it in the game's data. ROM hackers dug into the source code and discovered that the file for Black Knight's music theme is titled Zelgius 1. Those cheeky developers really couldn't keep a secret, huh? Additionally, there's unused stat values for different characters who never ended up on the battlefield, indicating that they were originally going to be playable enemy or NPC units. Namely, there's data for Naluki, Sigrun, and Cunnilingus. Meow. And you probably guessed it by now, but Zelgius has stat values as well, and those stats are identical to the Black Knights. Mario Kart and Fire Emblem go together like peanut butter and, I don't know, pineapple? They are very different. But there is one thing that they share in common. For a limited time, when Mario Kart Double Dash was first released, certain copies came with a bonus disc full of bonus content for other Nintendo games. By linking your Game Boy Advance via link cable to your GameCube, you can get certain free items from St. Ilmine, one of the eight heroes of legend. In a few different Fire Emblem games, if you accomplish very specific requirements on certain chapters, like keeping a certain amount of NPCs alive, beating the chapter in a limited time, etc., you could unlock Gaiden chapters, or bonus levels, that help progress the story and give you an opportunity to get rare items. In The Blazing Blade, the disfigured morph, Kashuna, appears in three of the Gaiden chapters. This mysterious enemy won't attack, but he does create a barrier around himself that nullifies all magic. In order to unlock a secret ending, you'll need to defeat Kashuna three times. This is especially difficult in the chapter Genesis, as he teleports away after being attacked, effectively only giving you one turn to defeat him. That slippery little... pickle. If you do defeat him, Nurgle's death quote adds in a line about Aner, his wife. It may not seem like much, but it's the missing key that helps fully understand Nurgle's tragic backstory, which we'll cover in just a bit. Three Houses is probably best known for its intricate class system, its unique gameplay mechanics, and its Harry Potter castle ripoff setting. I mean, come on, there's even owls chilling there, that's not a coincidence. Three Houses is also known for having a pretty tragic story, with characters who also have pretty tragic backgrounds, one of which is Bernadetta, everyone's favorite Gen X poster child for anxiety. But through support conversations, we learn that there's a pretty good reason for her quirks. She grew up with an abusive father who would tie her to a chair all day to teach her how to be a quiet, submissive wife. Yeesh. I think this support combo is pretty well written and gives depth to Bernie's character, but apparently someone at Nintendo thought it was a bit much. In an update to the game, the line was patched and replaced with a simpler, he tied me to a chair. I mean, it still gives you an idea of the abuse, but it just doesn't flesh it out as much. I don't know who was asking for these changes.
In Shadows of Valencia, you can collect wine and other alcoholic beverages and just have a good time. Actually, these items are basically useless because you can't consume them. I mean, you could sell them or offer them to a statue of Mila because I guess it's fine for the goddess to get drunk, just not our heroes. And the source code for the game is an age value that's tied to each character. Their ages don't really factor into the game in any way, so these values probably were tied to whether or not they were old enough to consume the alcoholic items. For whatever reason, this idea ended up getting scrapped, leaving the alcohol as kind of a pointless carryover. We can only speculate why the developers removed it, but it probably has to do with the fact that the drinking age is different country by country, so that would have complicated things too much, or the fact that the older characters would have had an unfair advantage, that advantage being that they know how to party. <laughs> Nurgle, the main villain from The Blazing Blade, may seem like a shallow character on the surface, but he's actually got a really interesting level of depth, and I think we should get into it. Now, I've been told before that I too often undercut serious narratives with dumb fart jokes and cutaways, so let me just get this out of my system. Alright, I'm ready to be serious now. If you manage to beat Kashuna in Chapter 19, and Nils is level 7 or higher, which is not easy for a bard, you'll get the chance to play Chapter 19 XX, a glimpse in time which is a secret chapter within an already secret chapter. Ninian wanders into some nearby ruins, where she has a flashback of who we assume is Nils and herself as children. Their father, presumably Nurgle, tells them to wait at home until his return. Their mother, Aner, had been kidnapped by bad men, and he's going off to pursue them. He tells them that if he's not back soon, to flee through the Dragon's Gate. During the mission, Eliwood and company are ambushed by some of Nurgle's henchmen, after fighting their way through, Eliwood encounters their leader, Theodore. A druid who studies black magic, he explains that the only way to master the dark arts is to completely sacrifice oneself to it, losing your identity along the way. After he's defeated, the group finds Ninian, who is staring at a painting she found inside the ruins. The group leaves, and we don't get to see what the painting is of. Later, Nurgle transports to the same spot in the ruins. He looks for something there, but he can't remember why. He only remembers that he used this place as a study during the scouring, commenting that it must not have been that important if he couldn't even remember what he was looking for. Now, if you've beaten Kashuna on all three Gaiden chapters, Nurgle's death quote changes. The following line is added. Why did I want more power? Aner? I don't understand. And at the end of the credits of the game, the closing artwork is replaced with this painting of a man and a dragon in love. So, this is the story as it's implied. Nurgle fell in love with the dragon during or before the scouring. War broke out, and Aenor was kidnapped. The details of this are vague, but since man and dragon were at war, an interspecies relationship would have made them targets for violence. Nurgle goes after Aenor, but never finds her. Nils and Ninian go through the Dragon's Gate, and they live for centuries as dragons. Time works differently in that dimension, thus them being just a little bit older when they eventually return to the world of man. Nurgle spends years in Arcadia, studying the Dark Arts, hoping to find a way to open the Dragon's Gate himself so he could be reunited with his children. Now that the war is over, it's relatively safer for Nils and Ninian to return. In his study of the Dark Arts, he completely loses his mind. The darkness strips him of his memories and identity, and he no longer remembers why he wants to open the Dragon's Gate. His reasoning now is to unleash the dragons on the world, drain them of their immense power to make himself stronger. He calls Nils and Ninian from the other side of the Dragon's Gate, unaware of who might respond. The siblings willingly go through the gate, hearing their father's voice. When they're in the human realm, Nurgle strips them of their dragon power, and the siblings are forced to flee, setting up the events of the main story. Nurgle doesn't remember that these are his kids, which makes what happens later much more sad. When Nurgle tricks Eliwood into killing Ninian, he's gloating about his own daughter's murder, which is tragic considering his whole journey began with him trying to reunite with his children so that they could be a family again. Another detail is added when you defeat Kashuna three times. After Nurgle's defeat, Nils begins to cry. He comments that he doesn't know why he's crying. This could be implied two ways. It could be that he and Ninian always knew Nurgle was their father. It could also mean that they were separated for so long on the other side of the Dragon's Gate that they only vaguely remember him, and the mention of their mother's name made everything come back to him. 
if not just subconsciously. Either way, it's really sad. So that's the tragic backstory of Nurgle. It's funny how such a mustache twirling, mwahaha cliche villain with seemingly no humanity could have such a depthy backstory hidden so deeply inside this game. Hey, I am who I am, alright? Better out than in, I always say. I agree, 2001's Shrek. When I first played Path of Radiance, I didn't think too much about Soren. As an advisor to Ike, he's a sullen, dour kind of guy and fits into the antisocial secondhand man category pretty well. I am not in a bad mood, this is just how I am. But unbeknownst to me at the time, Soren's got a lot more going on under the surface. The Mad King Ashnard and his lust for power mated with a dragon woman named Almeida, with the goal of creating a powerful half dragon son. Soren was their offspring, but when he didn't live up to Ashnard's standards, he dumped his son off in a foster home and never looked back. Ashnard would then go on to capture Almeida's brother and ride him around as a pet because Ashnard is a dick. Soren's childhood doesn't get much better from there, hopping around from foster parent to foster parent and being homeless for a while. He eventually meets Ike, and Ike ends up being the first person to ever really show him kindness, so Soren decides to work with him. The big reveal about Soren's parentage doesn't occur until the very end of Radiant Dawn, so a lot of players may have missed it entirely. In my Fire Emblem Engage video, I went over who I think are top-tier wifeys, with Lucina, Lythe, and Citrine being pretty high up on the list. I don't know, there's something about a sassy tomboy that really does it for me. So it should come as no surprise that when Scarlet was first introduced in Fire Emblem Fates, that I'd take an immediate liking to her. Scarlet is a wyvern rider from Noor that leads an underground resistance movement against King Garen. She saves Corrin's life and birthright and joins your party, but in Conquest, things don't turn out so great for her. She's captured by Hans and is killed off-screen, with her death being described as particularly barbaric to make an example out of her to anyone else that would rebel against Nor. In Revelation, she joins the party in Chapter 16, but then by Chapter 18, she's toast again, this time getting killed by a giant fireball. You can imagine how upset I was when this happened, considering I had just MARRIED HER! BURY THAT GIRL! BURY HER BECAUSE SHE'S DEAD! Yeah, I had heard that Scarlet leaves the party shortly after joining, and I thought that maybe marrying her would change the outcome. Considering you really only have two missions together, it's pretty difficult, but not impossible, to reach an S-rank support with her, so that's what I did. But it didn't change her fate. Her Fire Emblem fate. Then from Chapter 18 on, I played the rest of the game with that John Wick dead wife angst, killing as many enemy units as humanly possible. But sadly, the blood of my enemies would not bring my dead wife back. But hey, that's what we have mods for. One day I stumbled across a modder by the name of Big Fake, who was posting in a few different Fire Emblem forums and Reddit posts about a change he made to Revelation that would prevent Scarlet from eating it. I went through every response to his posts and couldn't find a single person that could confirm that their mod worked, with the only evidence being two blurry screenshots. So I decided to find out for myself, once and for all, if Scarlet could be saved. I learned how to patch hacks into CIA files and loaded up a copy of Revelation. Scarlet doesn't die until chapter 18, and I didn't even know if this hack had loaded into the game. I would literally have to go through two-thirds of the game just to see if I had even done it right. So I put the game on the easiest setting, put all my experience into Corrin and flying units, and just tried to plow through Revelation as fast as I could. When I got to chapter 18, it played out as it always had, which at first was very, very disappointing. But then, what's this? Scarlet was only injured. We did it, boys! Scarlet saved! I played the next chapter with her just to confirm she wouldn't, like, glitch out or something, but fortunately, the game had no issue recognizing her as a unit. There you have it. After all these years, I finally got some closure and was able to save my wyvern riding badass wife from certain doom. Thanks to Big Fake for making this mod, I can confirm that it does indeed work. I'm so happy, you guys. You don't even know.
In Shadows of Valencia, Faye is a childhood friend of Alm that's been smitten with him ever since they first met. It's a one-way relationship, though, as Alm's more of a thigh man. Yeah, I said it. Faye's personality doesn't really evolve past overly attached girlfriend, minus the girlfriend part. But interestingly, her obsession with Alm is actually programmed into the gameplay. Units in Valencia get stat bonuses if they fight near each other, and that bonus is based on their support level. So if Alm and Claire are at an A rank, they'll get a plus 10 to their avoid, for example. But Faye is unique in that she's the only character in the game to get a negative stat when around another unit. The further she levels up her support with Alm, the worse her avoid gets, maxing out at a negative 15% when her and Alm reach their A support. The joke here being that her obsession with him causes her to be distracted on the battlefield. It's an interesting easter egg, but one has to wonder what motivation the player would have for pairing Alm and Faye up together if she only gets worse as a fighter. Some people just like toxic relationships, I guess. Like the Joker and Harley Quinn, or me and Taco Bell at 2am. The first US TV ad for the Blazing Blade kinda plays out like any other ad for a video game at the time, aka it was written by some studio execs that know next to nothing about the product they're supposed to be selling. I mean, have you seen the ad for Golden Sun? Why is there a chandelier monster? Did they even look at the game? But I'm getting sidetracked. The Fire Emblem ad starts in a medieval castle, with several warrior types sitting around a table eating a feast, when suddenly one of them drops dead. What's happened to Dorcas? I put poison in his mouth. <laughs> what happened to Dorcas indeed? Who is this man, and why did he poison his mutton? What really grinds my gears about this ad is the tagline goes on to say, Build an army, trust no one. It was during the early 2000s when everyone was trying to act tough and gritty, and it was probably some psychological reflex to 9-11, but that's a whole nother thing. So I get why the ad is the way it is. But you could tell the people that made this ad don't know anything about Fire Emblem at all. Fire Emblem Lords often put themselves in vulnerable positions so they can reach out to their enemies in battle and try to get them to change sides. They put their trust in people who might stab them in the back because they see the good in them. This theme is the complete opposite of trust no one. Truthfully, there is nothing more to the storyline beyond the writers of this ad wanting to create a certain type of atmosphere for a game they've clearly never played, and Dorcas was probably just one of the characters' names drawn from a hat. It just as easily could have been Hector, or Urk, or Lin. Okay, maybe not Lin, but you get the idea. Still, the mystery of why Dorcas was poisoned by one of his compatriots has remained a meme in the Fire Emblem community ever since the ad came out in 2003. It was actually referenced in a jokey, throwaway line in Fire Emblem Heroes, How's my health? Well, I had some bad mutton earlier, but I feel fine otherwise. A game that I hesitate to call canon, but if it is, then that would make this weird US commercial canon as well. Also, fun fact, I've been to this castle. It's Elaine Donnan in Scotland, and it's not full of backstabbing brigands, but uh, creepy wax mannequins of the Down Abbey cast. With a name like Three Houses, you might assume there's three different paths to play, but there's actually four. That's because halfway through the game, there's an important decision the player has to make. When Endelgard officially stands against Rhea, whose side do you take? I'm sorry about the rhyming. If you took Rhea's side, you'll be choosing the Silver Snow route, also known as the lamest route in the game. There's not a whole lot of interest here, and it very much feels like a default route. Well, in the May 2020 edition of Nintendo Dream Magazine, Fire Emblem creative director Toshiyuki Kusakahira, sorry if I butchered that, officially confirms what fans assumed about Silver Snow. He said Edelgard's transition to antagonist was the catalyst for where all the different routes would go, with Silver Snow being the first route they worked on. So if Silver Snow feels like the most vanilla route, that's why. Tharja is a character you might call a yandere, which is like a cute Japanese way of saying a uh, stalker creep. Consistently throughout the game, she shows her obsession with Robin, the avatar, by following them around, professing her feelings for them, 
and threatening violence on anyone who gets too close to them. And in fact, her stalkery relationship with Robin is actually toned down in the English translation. In the Japanese version of the game's official website, they had little mini-stories for each chapter to give a little background on events that weren't covered in the game, which is pretty cool actually. In Chapter 9, where Tharja is first introduced, we get a scene explaining her obsession. Basically, the night before, she had a vivid sex dream where someone who looked like Robin was showing her a real good time. When she sees Robin, she tells them that they must be together because that's what her dream lover promised her. Talk about oversharing, my god. But besides being addicted to Robin's ripper bod, there may be an in-universe explanation for Tharja's obsession. Robin, as we come to find out, is a vessel for Grima, the main antagonist of the game. Grima is an ancient evil dragon who was created and defeated in Shadows of Valencia and then came back a thousand years later in Awakening. He was defeated again, and now he's looking to use Robin as a host to be reincarnated. Tharja is a Plegian. Plegia is a nation that was originally created by Grima cult members, and thus a lot of Plegians are invested in the Dark Arts and obsessed with resurrecting Grima. Robin shares Grima's bloodline, so maybe, even just subconsciously, Tharja can sense the evil dragon's presence inside the Avatar. And we all know nothing revs goth girl's engines quite like a person possessed by an ancient evil dragon, am I right? Rolf is the youngest member of the Greel mercenaries and half-brother to Oscar and Boyd. These brothers have a pretty tight connection, even being able to perform a triangle attack in Path of Radiance. In Chapter 3-1 of Radiant Dawn, there's a house you can enter and talk to an NPC woman. If you enter the house with any of the three brothers, it'll unlock an additional scene in the next chapter. The woman sneaks into Ike's camp and tries to speak with Oscar and Boyd. It's revealed that she's their mother, who abandoned them after her husband, their father, got sick and she didn't want to deal with it. She says that she wants to see Rolf and take him home with her, but Oscar and Boyd tell her to f*** off. Rolf eventually shows up and, to the woman's dismay, also tells her to f*** off. It's a really sad scene about a selfish mother who regretted her actions and the rift it created in her family. But it also helps show how her actions led to the three brothers coming together and forming a stronger bond than they would have otherwise. Really good writing, really sad, and very easily missable if you didn't happen to take the brothers to that specific house. Ritsa is a mysterious character in Three Houses, with a lot of his backstory being locked behind DLC. A lot of the characters in this game require uh, playing multiple routes to get a full picture of them, but I thought Juritsa in particular was pretty mysterious and deserving of his own topic on the iceberg. He's originally introduced as the fencing instructor during the academy phase of the game. He wears a little mask, and that's red flag number one that he's got some secrets. We later find out that he is in fact the Death Knight, and was working with Edelgard during her time as the Flame Emperor. If you chose to side with her, that'll take you on the Crimson Flower route, which is the only route where Yuritsa is playable. He wasn't originally, but a later update to the game added him in. Crimson Flower is my first route and I played the game on day one, so I never got to recruit him. I guess that's what I get for supporting the series on day one, thanks a lot, Intelligent Systems. Through support conversations, we learn that his real name is Emil, and that he's the half-brother of Mercedes. They were separated as children, and his upbringing in a different house was a miserable one, leading him to grow up as a stone-cold killer. Fortunately for Yuritsa, he fights against the player and dies in every other route in the game, further proving that Crimson Flower is the canon route, but that's just my opinion. That's based on facts and reality. Hashtag Black Eagles for life. The titular Fire Emblem is an item of great importance in every game of the series. In The Binding Blade, it was the name of the seal that locked away the final boss. In Shadow Dragon, it's the name of the Binding Shield, an item blessed by the goddess Naga to defeat fell dragons. Basically, what it is changes in every game, but it always inevitably ends up being a MacGuffin the player needs to find to stop the main antagonist. Three Houses is unique in that it never actually uses the term Fire Emblem. Instead, it's the Crest of Flames, a mark on Byleth that allows them to wield the legendary Sword of the Creator. This marks the first time in a Fire Emblem game where the Fire Emblem isn't a thing at all, but a person. Tell me that's not a perfect joke, I dare you. Erica and Ephraim are the dual protagonists of the Sacred Stones and Twins. They have a very close relationship, so close that some players have interpreted their feelings 
in a different sort of way, and it's led to a long-lasting meme in the Fire Emblem community. It's even mentioned in Fire Emblem Heroes, with Ephraim saying that the rumors about him are disgusting. But their potential twincest isn't completely unfounded. There's a couple odd things Ephraim says, like in this convo with Myrrh, where he says sisters are his weakness, or a support convo the siblings have together where Ephraim talks about stroking Erica's face. There's also the fact that they have a paired ending together, which doesn't necessarily mean anything, but those are usually reserved for romantic interests. Honestly though, I think the nail in the coffin is the fact that their weapon names, Sigmund and Sigland, are named after an incestuous couple from Norse mythology. I mean, they could have named their weapons literally anything else. These rumors may have gone all the way to the top, as Ephraim's exclusion from Engage might indicate that the developers were trying to avoid this connection. Honestly, I don't see what the big deal is. If it's good enough for Luke Skywalker, then it's- OBJECTION! Camilla was first introduced in Fire Emblem Fates as Corrin's step-sibling, who also seems to have the hots for Corrin, by the way. Which, you know, I'd make a joke about, but my lawyer, Phoenix West, just advised me to lay off the incest jokes for a while, so whatever. But one interesting thing that I found out about Camilla, and it's really hard not to see it anymore once you've seen it, is that she kinda looks like a cow? Move over, sexy cat people. We have a new kink that's all the rage. Talking about sexy... Cowgirls. Never mind, that's already a thing. I'd like to direct the jury to take a look at Exhibit A, the cow ears. Now take a gander at Exhibit B, the black and white color palette. Exhibit C, Camilla, sounds like Cowmilla. And my final conclusive piece of evidence, milk. But in all seriousness, even Camilla's designers noticed this. In the 25th anniversary art book, in an interview with two of the designers, they joke about how she looks like a cow and that they should have given her a black and white cape to complete the look. So there you have it, straight from the cow's mouth. I hope you all found this topic in the iceberg very amusing. Boo, you stink! <laughs> In Genealogy of the Holy War, Forseti is a benevolent dragon who helped the Twelve Crusaders stop the Loptrian Empire and bring peace to the world. Nils is a half-human, half, half manichaete from the Blazing Blade, who Lin and company rescue from Nurgle and his agents. So what if Nils and Forseti are one and the same? Well, for this theory to work, we need to assume that the Blazing Blade takes place before Genealogy of the Holy War. Before the events of the game, Nils and Ninian flee Alib to go live beyond the Dragon's Gate as the humans in Alib were committing violence against dragons. Years later, they returned through the gate in human form, and they met up with Lin, Eliwood, and Hector. Through their journeys, Nils began to see the good in mankind, and his heart was softened. Many centuries later, before the events of Genealogy of the Holy War, Nils is now going by the name Forseti, and he advocates for humans before Naga and the other dragons. It's his belief in humans' goodness that convinces the dragons to intervene and bestow their power into the Twelve Crusaders. Nils and Forseti are both manichaeans. They both have green hair. Forseti looks a lot like an adult version of Nils, and Forseti's defense of humans is a natural next step for Nils' character arc from the Blazing Blade. Also in Genealogy of the Holy War, Forseti possesses a man named Lewin, who is a bard, just like Nils. This is totally just a fan theory with no solid evidence at all, but it's an interesting one. In Three Houses, you'll meet a lot of troubled youth, perhaps none more troubled than Mary Ann. She's often gloomy and antisocial, and shows a lot of the classic signs of depression. And for good reason. She bears a beast crest, which is commonly believed to turn the bearer into a monster, and Mary Ann fears this will inevitably be her fate. She's part of the Golden Deer House, so if you chose that path, you'll get to see her grow up and further develop as a character throughout the rest of the story. However, if you play any of the other paths, she'll be molded into the second half of the story as well, but only if you recruited her beforehand. Interestingly, she's the only character, post-time skip, who doesn't reappear unless recruited. This of course led Fire Emblem fans to assume the worst case scenario. But it's not unfounded. In an A support with Byleth, Marianne says that she's constantly praying for death. So, no pressure, but 
maybe you should ask her to be part of your house. While we're on the topic of fan theories, let's talk about everyone's favorite Fire Emblem game, Fates. <laughs> One thing that has to be established here is the idea that all of Fates may not have really happened and might just be a myth or a story created within the Fire Emblem Awakening world. The Before Awakening DLC in Fates establishes that in Elise, Hoshido and Nor are considered legends, which could also mean that they take place way in the past. It's left open to interpretation. Reddit user Monopoly Rubix makes a pretty convincing argument for Fates not just being a piece of Elise in fiction, but specifically a porno. Mamma mia! The logic being that Fates' story is so bad and the themes so non existent, it really doesn't seem like the kind of story that would get passed on generation to generation, does it? But if it's not meant to be a well written legend, but instead smut, well, that would explain the pantsless woman, the hot springs, and the face f***ing. But then, who wrote Fates? Inigo. Inigo is a bit of a philanderer in Awakening, so why wouldn't he write some erotic fanfiction? And the fact that there's a whole story arc about him and two of his friends leaving the Awakening world and creating new personas and Fates, I mean, that's just Tolkien putting himself into Lord of the Rings via Tom Bombadil. That's right, I'm comparing Lord of the Rings to Fire Emblem Fates. Come at me in the comments section, I'm not afraid. Well, this has been the Fire Emblem Iceberg. Thanks for watching, and if you like my stuff, please support me on Patreon. I have some cool bonuses to patrons, like early access and bonus videos, and for this iceberg, I've got an extra long version as well, with extra topics, so if you want more Fire Emblem stuff, check out patreon.com slash westdoesgames. Thanks to Jilly Mays, Bosick, and Chaz Bezenko for supporting me. Everyone else, uh, what are you doing? Get that credit card out. Daddy needs some spending money. Thank you all for watching. See you next time.